Good evening, White Marsh. I'd like to call the White Marsh Township Board of Supervisors meeting for August 12th, 2021 to order beginning just a few minutes after 7 p.m. JC? To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Fran, do you have some announcements? I do. Thanks, Laura. The White Marsh Police Department reminds everyone that school returns on Monday, August 30th. Be mindful to watch for pedestrian school buses and school zones. Join the Shade Tree Commission at Miles Park on Tuesday, September 7th for a 6 p.m. walkthrough of the park and discussion about the recent tree survey report. The regular Shade Tree meeting will follow at the Township Building at 7.30 p.m. The tree survey report can be found on the Township website in the Shade Tree Commission page under the Boards and Commissions tab. PennDOT has announced a portion of Stenton Avenue will be closed between Butler Pike and Sheaf Lane beginning Monday, August 16th. Stenton will be closed on weekdays between the hours of 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. until December 31st. Local access will be permitted through the construction zone. And don't forget, the Township Day will take place on Saturday, September 18th from 12 noon until 5 p.m. at Victory Fields. Come join us for a day full of family-friendly activities and help support local businesses and community organizations. That's it. Thank you, Fran. Um, I just want to say tonight we have we are in person, obviously, here, and we do have residents and people attending the meeting, but we are also streaming through YouTube tonight, correct? That is correct. Yes. yes so we have other people here I just wanted everybody to kind of be aware of that we did do a little bit of a cross check earlier to make sure that that was working yes and it's a view only on YouTube yes. at this point yes yes excellent thank you and I'm also going to just highlight what Fran said about the September 7th shade tree walkthrough at Miles Park the the this tree survey because there are some trees that are not in good health uh, so that's going to be addressed. So for everybody here to know that that's an important time to spend with our arborists to walk through and, and hear more about what's happening with the trees there at Miles Park. Excellent. So we are going to move to public hearings. And the first before us is, uh, I should put my glasses on, public hearing for conditional use 02-21. Osaka Hibachi Japanese LLC 551 Germantown Pike store number two which is in the restaurant a restaurant in the VC1 village commercial uh, district excuse me chair Nestor can yeah. you just uh, ask for a motion to open the public hearing please sorry That's do it. I have a motion to open the public hearing so moved. second all those in favor aye, aye. thank you okay Good evening. madam chair um, before we start in with testimony, um, I did want to mark some township exhibits for the record, please. Sure. Um, township exhibit uh, T1 is the proof of publication of notice of this evening's hearing uh, that was published in the Times Herald on July 28th and August 4th, 2021. Exhibit T2 is the application uh, with floor plans and photographs uh, attached. Exhibit T3 is a lease agreement for the property. Exhibit T4 is an assignment and assumption of the lease. Exhibit T5 is a property owner consent letter dated June 24th, 2021. Exhibit T6 is a Montgomery County property records photograph uh, of the property. Exhibit T7 is the Montgomery County Health Department approval letter dated May 6th, 2021. Exhibit T8 is the applicant meeting notification letter uh, that was sent to the applicant dated June 28th, 2021. Exhibit T9 is a resident meeting notification letter sent to surrounding residents dated June 28th, 2021. 
Exhibit T10 is the Zoning Ordinance Compliance Review authored by Mr. Guttenplan. That is dated June 29th, 2021. Exhibit T11 is a copy of the posting that was placed at the property, uh, giving public notice of tonight's hearing. Uh, and Exhibit T12 is the, are the minutes of the July 13th, 2021 uh, White Marsh Planning Commission at which this uh, application was discussed and acted on by the Planning Commission recommending approval. Those are the board uh, township exhibits uh, for this matter and at this time it would be appropriate to turn it over uh, to Council to uh, present the uh, applicant's case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sharon Harvey and I represent the applicant Osaka Hibachi Japanese LLC in this application for a conditional use permit. I also would like to note for transparency purposes that I am a member of the Media and Communication Advisory Board of White Marsh Township. So with that said, let's get started. Let's get started. Uh, the subject property uh, is located in the New World Shopping Center, which is directly across the street from this building and it formerly housed the Maduri uh, Deli. And then in 2019 or 2018, a toy store, which eventually closed in 2019. The situated uh, restaurant would be between the White Marsh Pharmacy and the, nail, the Crystal Nail Salon, that, that store. So I, you have a visual. I'm sorry, is he's already here. Oh. Uh, applicant uh, proposes an authentic hibachi grilling restaurant, and the restaurant would use a gas grill as opposed to the open grate uh, design. The restaurant is mainly takeout services with approximately 21 seats for people to wait while their um, orders are being prepared. There is no table service. The proposed hours of operation would be Monday through Thursday, 11 a.m. to 9.30, Friday and Saturday, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m., and Sunday, 12 to 9. It doesn't interfere with the uh, pharmacy who closes at 6 p.m., Monday through Friday, and the nail salon who closes at 7, Monday through Friday. The restaurant has shared parking uh, with other tenants in the shopping center, and the shopper's center provides uh, adequate parking for, to accommodate the, uh, say, takeout service. The, there are no, uh, I read your regulations about the tree lines. Uh, there are no trees on the restaurant side of the uh, facility, it is curbside trees um, that uh, provide a buffer on Germantown Pike. Trash removal currently is one week, uh, I'm sorry, once a week by a private contractor and deliveries would be made in the back. Uh, the new restaurant uh, expands the culinary diversity of this community and would help uh, the tax base by employing two to three, uh, three to four um, employees, which helps also helps the health and vitality of our community. We have, uh, I'm sorry, as Mr. Sadler said, we received uh, quite a few uh, letters, one from the architect regarding the fire marshal's requirements. Also, the floor plan, which I'll go get to in a minute, um, is in conformity with the um, fire code. The floor plan, and this is the, oh, do we have a pointer today? Yes. Just press the button in the middle. Okay. So the floor plan, this is the customer's seating area, which would have about 20, 21 seats. This is the counter that separates the, the uh, customers from the workstations. And then we have the prep food prep area here, here, and here. There are the one ADA compliant uh, bathroom. 
We have two freezers, two walk-in freezers here. And the grills are located on this side along with the deep fryers. The storage bins would be under here and in the rear, here and here. And the, I'll say mop sink is here and leading to this, and then next to the steps uh, leading to the basement. And the basement is used solely for storage. Uh, one of the exhibits that Mr. Sandler also spoke of is that the uh, Montgomery County Health Department has already um, discussed the and approved the uh, plans. So we were just we request that this board approve the plans to grant the conditional use permit. And are there any questions? Can you confirm that there's no uh, on-premises dining that is takeout only? But there is no. I can confirm that there is no uh, on-premise dining. There are just going to be chairs situated here just for people to wait for their takeout. Okay. Thank you. That was the question I had. So thank you. Do we have any other questions? Is it the same owners from Chestnut Hill? No, it is not. They, these are the owners right behind me. Um, no it's a young couple. Um, but they're not related or associated with the Osaka Hibachi. Okay. Um, that is a, a sort of a franchise uh, restaurant in Chestnut Hill. They are not. It's a, a, a regional, how they cook regionally. It is called a Osaka type of a regional cooking. Okay. And we do have copies of the menu, if you would like to see. How soon can we yeah. order? <laughs> Don't make me hungry. We just started yeah. the meeting. Can you get it here before the meeting's over tonight? <laughs> I am curious, you know, if this is approved, how long it is anticipated to take uh, to actually be open. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you. Ms. Harvey, I noticed you're handing something to the board. Do you want to mark an exhibit? Uh, for the record? Yes. Uh, okay, this is exhibit uh, A1 uh, entitled Osaka Hibachi Japanese Menu. Yes. Uh, noting the hours of operation uh, at the top and um, looks like a uh, Japanese menu. A full menu, yes. Will this um business offer delivery or be on one of the mobile apps like DoorDash or Grubhub or anything like that? So she said that they would do uh, online, so they would be able to do delivery if necessary. Do you know if there's other businesses in the center that are open as late as you propose to be open on Saturday and Sunday? No, I do not. The other restaurant, but that's about it. The, but on this end, no, they're not open as late. The, the paint store is not open as late. The, what is that? Well, the pharmacy I know closes, the nail salon closes, and the market closes too. So there, are, those are the four adjacent stores right there. So but on the other side, there is a, a restaurant. Okay. The Mexican restaurant. Yeah, from the boot. What are the requirements mm -hmm. for operation, operational hours, if any? I don't think there is any. Pay, like Ten o'clock is not uh, an issue. So Ten o'clock is not a problem. Nine thirty on Sunday, not a problem. Especially it's takeout. Nine, nine, nine on nine. Sunday. Not nine on nine, Sunday. Nine, sorry. Yeah. And it's takeout too. You're not going to have people dining in there okay. until like midnight, you know, or anything like that. All right. Thank you. All the deliveries are during these, are they early during the day? Like when you first open? Yes. <coughs> You're talking about deliveries of supplies. Supplies, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm sorry, yes, supply delivery. Mm -hmm. 
Are there any questions? Any other questions? Any other board questions? Do we have any public questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move this down to our motions. Do I have a motion to approve conditional use 02-21 Osaka Hibachi Japanese LLC slash 551 Germantown Pike for a restaurant in the VC1 district? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Congratulations. Congratulations. Good luck. Good, Good luck. luck to you. We look forward to having this be up and running quickly. We Thank meet you. every second and fourth Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have a motion to adopt the meeting minutes from July 8th, 2021? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Great motion carries. Thank you. So now we're going to public board discussion items. And the first here, actually the only one, is the review of the subdivision land development 01-21 Robbins Golf Holding LLC 27 East Germantown Pike. This is the preliminary slash final plan for building expansion and parking improvements. Yes, if we can turn it over to Mr. Guttenplan to introduce it and then to the applicant's attorney. Thank you. Um, just want to make a few introductory remarks before I turn it over to Mr. Hughes. Um, this is um, a little bit unique. This is, I think, the first um, land development restoration or rehabilitation of a historic building that we've seen in the um, historic district. Um, most of the um, certificates of appropriateness that you've seen have been for um, minor improvements like signage, etc. And in fact, you did approve a certificate of appropriateness for a sign for this building um, back in February. Uh, this is not only in the historic district, it's also in the VC2 district, uh, so it is in, must comply with those regulations as well. It is a preliminary final minor land development. Um, it involves the restoration of the existing building at this address as well as an addition to um, make the whole building usable as an office for the owner as a financial consultant. As you'll hear, it's going to be a single-use office building. It has gone through the zoning hearing board where there were several variances um, for parking uh, primarily because uh, the very thick walls in the existing building and that really skewed the parking count when you computed gross floor area so they re received some um, relief to have 14 versus 17 parking spaces and interestingly enough the zoning hearing board conditioned um, the parking on two of them being held in reserve as green space until and if they're ever used it's something that the um, zoning update committee is looking at township wide right now uh, so this is kind of a a new concept and there were a couple of other um, technical dimensional variances they received uh, this was looked at um, by the planning commission at uh, two of their meetings may 11th and june 13th uh, on may 11th they took action to re recommend a number of the waivers that are requested uh, then they waited for the Shade Tree Commission to review it, and um, on June, I'm sorry, on July 13th, after the Shade Tree Commission had looked at it on two occasions and recommended approval of the landscape plan, the Planning Commission recommended approval of all of the landscape waivers, and the only two waivers they took no action on were ones that had to do with fees. Um, Finally, um, when it came to action on the plan itself, the Planning Commission, um, from a legal standpoint, took no action. They were not able to get a motion passed either to approve, uh, recommend denial, or to take no action. The latter um, motion was a tie 
So um, Dave advises us that that means that the Planning Commission technically took no action on the actual plan itself and passes it on that way to the Board of Supervisors. With that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hughes, um, and there is a presentation that I believe his team would like to make. Good evening. Ed Hughes, I represent the applicant. Robbins Golf Holdings, LLC. They're proposing to restore the building at 27 East Germantown Pike with an 832 square foot addition to the existing building. The property is 0.3 acres in size. It's in the Village Commercial District. Uh, we're proposing a single unit, a single tenant building by an affiliate of the owner, a financial planning group. I have Josh Castillo, our engineer with me, and uh, Tom Robbins, the principal of the uh, LLC that owns the property. Uh, we, as Charlie mentioned, appeared before numerous township bodies and are here tonight for uh, appro ho hopefully preliminary final approval. We have received a draft of resolution, which we're prepared to accept uh, if uh, the council's uh, supervisors are willing to uh, give us approval this evening. So if, if you want us to go through our quick brief proposal, I can have Josh, uh, our engineer, go through uh, what we're showing you as far as the uh, proposed uh, expansion of the building, the parking lot, and related improvements, and the stormwater management facility, which we're uh, proposing to install on the property. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, Josh. Uh, we also have the presentation in handout format, which we'll hand out. Yes, that'd be great. That'd be great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take one yeah. if you have an extra. Not. Josh, that allows you to control to the right is the dancing. Hi, good evening. Josh Castillo with Wilkinson Associates. Uh, we're the site design engineers for uh, Mr. Robbins here. Um, I think uh, Charlie covered most of where we've been with this. So I'll just give you an overview. Um, we have a we have the um, site location map here um, and an aerial here showing the site. I'm sure you guys are familiar with um, this location at 27 East Germantown, which is um, just below Butler Pike here. Um, Tom, did you want to talk about the, the, this, or do you want to get into the site plan? I got the site stuff at the end. Um. Um, it's good to see the board again after six months, so it's been quite a process. So thank you for this time. My name is Tom Robbins. Um, I'd like to just to give you a quick history that I've experienced uh, with the property that may uh, give a little bit of background that talks about the difficulty of this specific project. So I'd like to outline here um, the property as it exists right now and what we plan to do with the property. As you can see, it's approximately um, 35 feet wide on a property line that's about 51 feet. So with the building and with the driveway, there's not a lot of spice left over. The original building was um, built according to information we have from the Plymouth White Marsh Historical Society about 1790. And uh, this front property has um, been um, purchased by a developer uh, last year, uh, uh, last October. Um, John Mayer owned that property. He purchased it from the estate of the Corson family in 2009. So from 2009 to 2020, uh, he was looking for an opportunity to develop that, had several proposals, and none of those came to fruition. Uh, as was pointed out at this board meeting, uh, this building has been under some level of neglect not only for years but possibly for decades uh, since that time period. And part of my role as a financial advisor is to bring that building back and make it a part of living history. Uh, I thought that was interesting because right outside the door there's that sign of White Marsh Town Shack with living history. So the goal that we have for this front part is to keep as much of the historical character intent which would actually be including the window stairs, the fireplace that we have on each end of this. Um, to make it historically accurate, but also handicap accessible, we need to lower the finished floor here nine inches so that we can come into this. And this uh, property here, uh, the stairs are not, um, 
suitable for any kind of certain certificate of occupancy. So the goal is to remove the existing kitchen, which is not historical, in this space of about 12 by 16, and put in um, a stairway that would be able to serve for the two floors of the building. In this section in here, we would put in bathrooms on both floors, and then the remaining space here would be about 375 square feet, which would be open office space. So it's, it's a quite modest um, development that we're looking at with the goal um, to utilize the historical features as well as we can to have windows and doors be intact and to uh, keep the stone walls as part of the feature of the building. Because part of the reason that I'm looking at this and acquiring this is that my financial advisory firm, we, we talk about acknowledging the past, preparing for the future, and being aware of the present. And what a great story to be able to tell by having that happen in a historic building where we can acknowledge the past, uh, prepare for the present, and plan for the future. So that whole focus is part of our journey. Uh, one of the challenges that I did not anticipate is sort of uh, the emotional energy that came around the develop of, of this site and the related sites that came around that. Um, but uh, it's, uh, I guess I'm a financial advisor and not um, uh, an area of, of uh, social media so much to be aware of that. But our whole focus then, um, is involved because of the minor development we have is involved with uh, the stormwater management um, and all the landscaping to have which has turned this uh, building and why we're asking for some of the waivers into an extremely expensive uh, proposition because when we take out the uh, square footage for the walls which is about 550 square feet for the walls we end up for a building that's about 2800 square feet and for the, the cost to complete this we're looking at a total project of about 1.1 million dollars so it's, it's quite significant on price. Uh, we're really looking forward to helping to make this part of the building. And one of the reasons we're asking for that is we're right now looking at the appraised values uh, that the township is collecting in tax revenues and also the earned income tax that the township is collecting from an empty building. And we would really love to be able to uh, uh, increase the revenue to the township by a significant degree by making this a live, active building and the hub of how we do our financial advisory practice and even uh, before the pandemic, we did a lot of remote business and a lot of clients out of town. So it has very minor impact on the actual activity of the building. But we do need a home office and a, a place to come together with our uh, team of five uh, for a couple of days a week. We find that if we don't meet uh, at least two or three days a week, we miss that company culture. So to have a place where we can come together like that is outstanding. Um, I think that um, the building here uh, because of its, its uh, size, it's really not practical to design this without making this addition here. Um, and uh, some of the journey that we've gone through here has been uh, the feedback of the disappointment of not having more trees planted in this property. But we've gone through and, and uh, uh, developed as much we can. Uh, the um, idea from the township um, um, planning committee. Uh, planning to shade tree was that we've done the best we can with this project. So uh, I just want to outline a little bit from the owner's perspective. Um, this will be the property that I will own. I would love to take care of it. I'm really looking forward to becoming an active part of this community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so here's a picture of the front of the building from the Board of Assessments. You can see how it's in dire need of uh, maintenance and repair. Some interior photos. This is the proposed addition at new floor plan here. Um, let's see. So you can see this darker black line here is the new addition footprint. This part here is the existing kitchen that's to be removed and turned into a stairwell. These are proposed elevations. Uh, as you can see, the frontage is being preserved and just maintained as what, it, I mean, um, refurbished as, as is pretty much. Uh, we don't have a color uh, rendering at this point, but um, the colors and everything have been through the harbor. Um, uh, this is the proposed layout of the site. Again, the gray portion here is the addition. Um, 
constitutes a total of about 832 square feet. Uh, and that's, that includes the kitchen back here. So the total footprint of the total addition footprint is less than 832. Um, we have a 16 foot wide driveway coming into the site, which is pretty much the maximum you could possibly get um, with uh, curb and all the other features that are required by ordinance. Um, coming back into the site, we have our 14 parking spaces, um, two of which these two are in reserve and will be uh, grass pavers. They're proposed to be grass pavers at this point. Um, and we have our uh, handicap accessibility. Um, we're putting a five foot wide sidewalk in the front uh, per ordinance and also uh, per PennDOT, as well as a handicap ramp and crosswalk here, which is all in the right of way. Property line actually sits right here. And so um, the sidewalk and the crosswalks, the curb ramp will all be in the right of way, uh, not right of way there. Um, and to, to the south here, we have the uh, auto body garage or the auto shop. And to the north, we have a, um, another historical building up in the historic district that's operating as a bike shop, I believe, at this point. Um, here's our, our current landscape that uh, went through Shade Tree Commission. Uh, we went through a couple iterations, more than a couple iterations with them to come out with this plan, which, uh, as Tom mentioned, they, uh, they said that they believe we've done all that we could with regard to landscaping. Um, and we have a, a pretty robust uh, and uh, native uh, list of plants that we're putting in here. Um, in this layout here, you can also see our stormwater management facility here, which takes up most of the parking lot. It'll be subsurface. And um, originally we had it designed as a, um, a pretty common pipe and stone type system, which uh, acts as retention for stormwater. Um, we've recently made some revisions to that based on our meetings with several groups in the township, and most importantly, recently, the uh, Planning Commission. So I'll talk about that in a moment as well. So did you have any questions about the site layout or, or any of the other features before I get into stormwater? Not yet. Okay, <laughs> great. So, okay, so um, we came in originally with um, a plan uh, with a stormwater design that worked from an ordinance perspective, which is to uh, make sure that we retain the water and release it at a slower rate than it comes in, therefore preventing uh, flooding, which is the sole purpose of retention. Um, and, and by that, we've met the ordinance. Um, since then, um, hearing feedback from the Planning Commission and other members of the township, we've gone a step farther um, and we've calculated the volume mitigation that we're doing for stormwater as well. So and we've taken somewhat of an initiative to do this um, and try to quantify the pre and post development volume of, of stormwater runoff. Um, so not to get too technical about it, I'll try to keep it simple, but um, rate, reduction we were able to handle that by putting it in a tank and releasing at a slow rate so it may last in the tank for days as it trickles out um, but in white marsh we have um, karst geology here which prevents us from actually letting the water seep into the ground below the basin so many times we'll leave the basin open and allow the water to seep into the ground here it can prevent it can present a problem because of the karst topography and and uh, create sinkholes as you've seen in certain areas of the township here so that being said we're required to line the facility with an impermeable liner therefore it becomes just a tank that doesn't allow the water to seep out um, we've taken the basin to uh, another step here by by way of holding water in the ba basin which is to be held without trickling out and after the storms are over when it becomes dry, we'll be able to pump that water out of the basin and use it for irrigation on the site. It's only about a half a foot of water that remains in there in order for us to meet 
a certain volume criteria that again is not really part of the ordinance but it's a standard uh, for other sites larger sites where we're required to get mpds permits and such so we're actually meeting that higher standard um, by way of doing that by way of uh, using these rain barrels and by way of planting the site so those are the three components really that we're using to to uh, mitigate volume and to meet that higher criteria um, to the left here this is this is a Brentwood storm tank it's a proprietary storm system that we've we're going to use in place of the pipe and stone that I mentioned this allows us to have a greater volume in the same footprint because it has more void space in it it's not just stone and pipe it's actually 97 percent void through the whole thing so um, once I ran through the calculations I was able to show that by way of holding about it's actually about seven seven and a half inches of water in the basin without letting it discharge we're able to hold that volume back and uh, we'll put into a, a maintenance in, uh, a, a maintenance agreement for this project that uh, the facility needs to be pumped out after storms how does that happen who pumps it out how does that happen yeah it'll be on the owner um, and and it will have to have a pump a, an electric pump that he can actually turn it on and use a hose but you'll flick a switch yes and and there's a hose so the and then the water what comes out through the hose yeah i mean whether it's a per, like a permanent system or just like a sump pump system we haven't really got into that but it that's that's the concept and that's what we'll hold to so theoretically you could take a, a sump pump or a, a pool pump i guess a pool cover pump or whatever they talk they, they call them and, and stick it in there and pump the water out and just you know hose his landscaping okay. the same concept for the, the rain barrels themselves um, we have five 100 gallon rain barrels we're proposing on this site they'll be connected to the the piping that enters into the the uh, storm system so anything that overflows that 100 gallons if we get larger storms like we have recently that it'll overflow into the system and it'll hold up in that that seven and a half inches there until it gets over that and then it'll trickle out of the system very slowly um, so by way of doing all that and then uh, i guess i'll back up the trees and shrubs are also counted toward um, volume control as well because of the um, uh, evapotranspiration that they provide basically they they suck up the water and allow it to evaporate so um you just said something about it trickling out i thought i thought this was this design it was not allowed to trickle out because no it, it it's still once you get higher to higher storms it still comes out yes okay yeah but the rates will all be greatly reduced and by way of putting this the seven and a half inch sump in there the rates went way down so i mean i can talk about the, the reduction but um, we are really uh reducing the rates went down the rate of what the the rate at which the water runs off the site so from from the pre-development to the post post-development condition regardless of the coverage regardless of the, the uh, impermeable uh, impervious surface we're reducing the rates it all goes into the system i think it's about probably uh, 90 percent of the site almost drains into this all, almost all the impervious surface and probably 90 percent of the site drains into the system so you really only have this back portion here that does not get captured in this system everything from the building and everything from this side and front yard here gets into catch basins and flows into the system um, you know, so once this system gets past that seven and a half inch mark it will release water and all those rates are reduced for each of the storm events that we are required to analyze so the two year through the 100 year storms are all greatly reduced and i can talk about the numbers but we're talking like you know 95 percent reduced in a 100 year storm and even uh, numbers similar to that in the, the lower storms too actually the two-year storm virtually has nothing coming off the site whereas today there's significant runoff coming off of the site so as i'm sure you'll recall we had a lot of discussions yes. about storm water at planning and we, we talked about the rate at which water will flow off the site post development and we talked about the volume of water that would flow off the site post development when you were at planning your plan had addressed 
the, volu the, um, the rate issue, but had not addressed the volume issue. So that as a result of that prior plan, the volume post-development leaving the site was actually greater, correct? Um, At least as much, if not greater. Yeah, it, it probably was. I didn't quantify it. So at that point, I hadn't quantified it, okay. but you're probably right. It would have been more involved. But that was, the, that was the prior plan. So now yes, we have correct. this plan with the seven and a half inches of retention, and I looked at your calculations and understand the balance. And just to confirm, my understanding is that with this change to the retention uh, system, the post-development volume of water that will flow off the site is now equal to or less than what it currently is. Correct. Yeah, so, so we are calculating it just the same way you would for the largest site in the country. That, you okay, know. so you've covered rate and now volume. Correct. Under what conditions, if any, would the volume of water exceed um, the current conditions? What kind of a storm would, it, would be required for that to happen? Um, that's probably, if it's, I don't know if I can, I, can, I can say, I mean, we don't do those calculations for anything. We use, we use the two-year storm for all of our MPS permits and our large sites. So those calculations that form the foundation for this design are based on the two-year storm? Correct. Okay. Right, which is, is the standard. Yep. All right, thank you. So, I mean, when you think about it, if you had, if you had rain for several days, your site is saturated, you know, so, you, you know, it, it's not going to hold the water back to the trees. I mean, the trees are saturated, you know, at that point. So, the way that it is today is the way that it would operate then as well. So, e even if you had an incident or an event where the volume might exceed, over time, that volume is going to be much lower than it currently is. Correct. All right. Thank you. You know, yeah, I mean, it'll keep the areas dry in the back there for all those lower storms. Yeah. So uh, that being said, um, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. The other questions I have are related to the ongoing maintenance. Um, the pictures look really nice, the rain barrels, the idea of the, the hose, the pump, it sounds like you still have to figure that out, but I'm a little concerned about, you know, what happens in a couple years, what happens in 10 years, what happens in 15 years. I mean, you know, this is a company that is interested in the preservation of history and the future, so that's exactly my concern, is how is that going to be upheld down the road? Yeah, uh, the, the maintenance agreement would hold the owner liable uh, for, for doing that. So in the instance that you, and, and you guys would have the ability, the township has the ability to come and inspect the property as well for that. Um, there would be a, a blanket easement across the site, which would, would allow access to the township to enter. And if they came in and saw something that wasn't per the agreement, then they would be able to enforce some action on that. So that, that's the way it's handled on uh, most cases. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe part of the, uh, the package on this land development process would be an improvement agreement and then the stormwater management BMP type agreement that the, part, the township's a party to that uh, authorizes the township to make sure we follow through on all the uh, required maintenance. And if we don't do it and problems result, the township can come in, take over, and then charge, back charge the owner for uh, his failure to maintain uh, the, the uh, system as required by the agreements. But that's pretty much, that's standard pretty much, even without this uh, volume retention type facility, it's, it's standard in, in the uh, rate control facility. So it's, it's a pretty standard document that has some teeth in it. And the township usually stays on top of those, uh, those kind of things, especially if there's uh, resultant problems. I guess my one question is, and then Supervisor Drazner already brought this up, about manual, I think you were talking about manually draining this thing. Like hit, is it actually hitting a switch? The owner has to do that, right? For the for the system? Yes, yeah. So is it actually just a switch or is there something that has to be done like labor intensive? 
Well, we have, it, regardless of how it's done, it, it's, it's going to be pumped out. So we, I mean, if it's acceptable to the township and, and to the township engineer, we might do something as simple as putting the sump pump in after a, a large storm or, or after a certain t storm. Um, maybe you could put some sort of quantity associated with it that it needs to be pumped out every you know, certain storm or something. But um, we haven't ironed it out yet. Um, it would be more costly, of course, to put a permanent type of pump in that would just have a switch. Um, but it's not out of the question. It really is up to, to Tom if he wanted to do something like that, that even had like a sprinkler system or something attached to it. That would that'd be really neat. But um, mm -hmm. I don't know that we'll be held to doing that. We'll have to cross that bridge, I guess, when we, when we put the details together and get it in the plan. But the concept won't change. I mean, my concern is just that, you know, Tom, you gotta, you're got you going to have to be there. I mean, I don't know how it works. I mean, Krista would be able to explain this, I guess, to me a little bit better. I'm not an engineer, but, you know, how, what's... If you go on vacation, who's your backup? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm required by financial securities law to have a backup every time I leave the office. Um, so that's something that we already have in place. Um, part of the reason that... Um, I was initially interested in, in uh, making this acquisition and have gone through quite an effort to try to bring this to conclusion is the fact that um, the reason that we have this is this tells a story about what we do. It's, it's about how you steward things over time and are responsible to that. Uh, the idea then that we're going to let the building that tells the story not be maintained properly and not be just an outstanding addition is something that um, I appreciate the question, but I, I actually find somewhat offensive. I am deeply engaged in making sure that my firm represents um, our resources to the best of our ability and have every intent to make sure that we can make this an outstanding property. Um, I don't have the specifics of what would be involved to make that easy, but I do believe in efficiency. Um, and so then if we could make an investment so that uh, it's a matter of hitting a switch to have that happen, or frankly, uh, contracting that out. Uh, I do believe in uh, delegation and, and having individuals to help with that process. So, uh, I mean, I have a landscape guy at my house because I love having a clean, green lawn, but I don't like cutting grass. Uh, I, I can imagine this process could be the same here. Question for Krista. Krista, could this also be automated in some way? It could. That's kind of what Josh was alluding to. I suppose you could put a pump on a timer. Um, there's yeah, think, many yeah, options. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm just not like a sump pump in a house. You know, right. Just like that. Yeah. Maybe yeah, tie it into an underground <laughs> sprinkler system. Yeah, I, 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 think, button, the, I think there are time. ways to address that issue, that concern. And the way it's written in, in the uh, materials here in item 10 of the proposed resolution is, is it leaves it uh, up to the uh, uh, the applicant and, and the township engineer to come up with a solution that results both in no increase in stormwater rate or volume in the post development condition. So that's the criteria. Um, I'm confident that our township engineer will work with the applicant to to come up with a a process that will allow that to happen. And my preference would be that it be automated so that you don't have to worry about doing it. You don't have to worry about delegating it to anyone. It just happens. And the other point worth mentioning is he has time after a storm event. Actually, it's probably better to wait a couple days till the ground is dry. So it's not something that has to happen immediately after an event. It could be days. Yeah. You could go on vacation. <laughs> we wouldn't want it to turn on during a storm either. No, absolutely not. And don't get offended by a question about that. This is White Marsh. Stormwater management is a big deal. So yeah. um, don't be offended. And, and you, you know, we've got to do our, our due diligence here. And as, it's at the same as at the Planning Commission, so. And I just want to piggy, piggyback on what was said about, um, you know, the automation and the systems involved. These are, um, and I know this was mentioned at Shade Tree, these are five large rain barrels. So any way to mitigate, you know, not dumping them all at once or some sort of a system so that you're not, you know, unleashing all of this water at the same time or, you know, however that, that works out. Krista, you would know better, um, you know, what those possibilities are. Yeah, I mean, the, the rain barrels are 
manual. I don't know if there's any way to automate that, so that would just be diligence on the owner's part. But they will overflow into the yes. the main retention basin. So if that's automated, then by right. extension, so are the rain barrels. Just to clarify, how do the rain barrels, do they overflow into the system simply because they overflow just into the ground and the ground is captured by the system? Or are they somehow connected to that system? Yeah, so um, the, the first flows, see this uh, connection here to the downspout? Right here? Mm -hmm. The first flows will get into the barrel. Once the barrel flow, uh, fills, this pipe is filled and the, and the interior of that downspout has a, there's a middle chamber that the water then comes out here, and this in exi this example here, it's just coming out onto a splash block. But in our our case, this will go into our piping system. Oh, okay, interesting. Okay, so thank you. Have tied in right underground there. This like a valve. Mm -hmm. As indicated, we've uh, reviewed the uh, draft resolution that's acceptable to us. We are asking for waivers, including waivers on the uh, traffic fee. I believe we're going to withdraw the waiver request on the park and rec fee. And Tom can explain uh, if you need any background on why we think it might be appropriate to have a waiver on the uh, trip generation fee, which is, as I think it's like seven, eight, almost $18,000. Um, the extra cost involved with this uh, volume control is about $8,000. And all the other things we did with regard to the uh, landscaping, et cetera. And we're appointment only type business. We're probably not there at the peak time between four and six. We wouldn't even make appointments at that time because you know German time pike backs up pretty good there. So we'd hope the board would be uh, acceptable to granting the waivers we requested and approve the preliminary final plan. Uh, maybe some township residents may want to have a say. Thank that, you. The, the, the park and rec fee was how much? That's $1,700. $1,700. As, as you know, there are different ways by ordinance to calculate that fee. And the township by right could request that fee be 10% in the value of the property. So the calculation as is, is significantly discounted from what the township by right could request. That's why I withdrew per the waiver. <laughs> yeah, clearly. Um, personally, um, given that s significant reduction, uh, I, I could not support a waiver of, of either fee, frankly. Of either fee? Either fee. That's just where I'm, where I am right now. Because I didn't really dig into or challenge the calculation of the trip generation. Well, let's, uh, let's, I'm not just an engineer, say, let's, but let's just say that you did that and we agree that the trip generation is probably overstated by 100%. So perhaps you'd be entitled to a 50% reduction of the, of the traffic impact fee. The park and rec fee as currently assessed is, is a, an order of many orders of magnitude less than what it by right can be. No, so no, what I'm saying we're prepared to, you to pay is, that. What I'm saying to you is that the, by charging a park and rec fee of $1,600, you are getting a significant discount without touching the traffic impact fee. Yeah, so again, I didn't really calculate the trip generation. When I calculated, it was a, lot, a little bit lower than what Krista came up with, plus argue that do we get any Frankly, credit? you could take the traffic impact fee to zero and we charge 10 percent on the park and rec fee you're paying more than right. we're currently requesting hmm. I mean, we, you know we're trying trying to just restore an historic building no, I, I think cool. that's nobody admirable. does that because I, I think what happens it costs too much I think so it's, ad walk away I think from it's it. admirable I support everything you're doing but it's just looking at at the numbers you're getting that discount you're already getting a significant discount on those fees do we have any other board comments at the moment 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have public comments? Yes, please come up and state your name. Lori Wilson, 4006 Butler Pike. Do you want to put the landscape plan up, Charlie? Good and plan. Our property is directly behind this property. It's Abolition Hall where we live. It's a little hard to, to discuss any of the storm auto issue. By the way, I don't care what he does with this building. It's fine. We used to own the building. Uh, couldn't afford to keep it. Robin's uh, or, uh, predecessor to him bought it and let it deteriorate. It looks like what it looks like now. It didn't look like that when we owned it. This plan, this is one third of an acre. It's hard to discuss what he's discussing here about what to do with stormwater management since none of those things he's saying are in the public documents that are provided for this meeting. But if you look at this plan, the top right corner, that little line there, which is actually quite large, that's where all this water spills out, and it spills out directly onto our property, which is right behind that. At the, at the closest point, it's only a couple of feet from our property line. And this is a big discharge facility. When he talks about uh, pumps and sump pumps and additional layers underneath what he originally proposed, it's going to be used for sprinkling. There's nothing to sprinkle here. Virtually everything on the property runs into that panel, into that underground storage facility, and then it's discharged onto our property. Almost the whole, whole property goes on to our property. And I don't know what there is to sprinkle except the very last little bit of his property, which again would run onto our property. My objection is not, oh, he has a lot of charts in the public documents for this meeting, which I refer to as shiny beads because they basically show a lot of data which doesn't really amount to anything. Discussion of the rate of flow off his property isn't the issue, it's the volume of the water. He's basically building on the entire property. Why? Because it's only a one-third of an acre and he's got to put all these other things that he wants to do. That's fine. But what he's creating is a condition where all the water on his property, virtually all of it, goes into that facility, which is that black line thing in the middle. You can see the lines run out to the, to the left to where it picks up water from the front of the property and sends it over there. And then it's all discharged onto our property. None of it goes into his ground. All of it goes into our ground. Now, he's specified that he wants an impermeable, impermeable barrier on his uh, underground facility, so none of it will sink into the ground because they don't want to get a sinkhole. Why is that any different from him put it, all this water goes on our property, and then we get the sinkhole. Now, I don't know how many of you people will live around these discharge facilities. We have another one that was mandated by the township right around the corner from us. If the plans had shown all the facilities within 500 feet, like he got a, a waiver not to show, you would actually see it on his plans. But that, from the office complex here, discharges water onto our property, what the rate is, that's not the issue. It goes for days and days and days. And when you walk out there days and days after everything else is perfectly dry, you're walking through splashing water because of the water that comes out of that thing. So it, it's the volume going off the property, not, not the rate. The rate has nothing to do with it. It's like a, it's like a smoke screen. We strongly object as the property owner that this is all gonna be discharged onto all this additional water being put onto our property. I have no problem with what he wants to do with the building. We have historical buildings too. They have a lot of history attached to them. I will say that our backyard here, which I've been mowing for 40 years, by the way, it does kind of have a name. It's not just open ground. It's called the orchard. This, all this land that runs this way behind the various people's property. And I know it's called the Orchard, and we know what it looked like because Thomas Helvenden painted it in 1891 when we had the painting. And it shows this with orchard trees, which obviously don't exist 130 years later. But uh, that's what that's called. It's called the Orchard. It's not just dumping ground for his water to go into ours. I strongly object to the fact that there's a concern about sinkholes on his property and no concern whatsoever about that water going on to our property. And be, regardless of all these discussions of pumping water, there's nowhere to pump it except back onto our property. Thanks.
Thank you, Mr. Wilson. For, for the applicant, we've heard before that one of the requirements of the resolution or the proposed resolution is that it, there would be no greater volume to, to, to go off. But you know, how can you convince us that, uh, or, or really respond to, to Mr. Wilson's concerns about where that water is going to go? Well, I mean, not to get legal, but we're entitled to approval if we hit the ordinance requirements. Or the ordinance that, I can't hear you. Say that again. <laughs> We're entitled to approval if we comply with the ordinance. The ordinance has no volume control requirements. We're going above and beyond what's required. And water's been running through this property onto that property since I think the building was built in 1790. I mean, it goes somewhere and it naturally goes in the same direction it's going to go after we're developing. But now we're going to control the volume in a two year storm above and beyond what's required. And we're controlling the rate, which is what's required. So. Uh, we you know we, Mr. Wilson's been making these complaints for a long time, and we have responded with regard to the volume control as suggested by the Planning Commission. So there's only so much you can do. Uh, so I guess I'm we can't infiltrate it because we're in the karst situation. How, how is there less volume then going on? If if all the same water is going there, how is it less? Because we're holding it in the basin, on the underground container. We're holding that volume there which slows the, the rate of how it goes out, but doesn't it all eventually go out? I mean, it's not sitting there forever. Well, the rate is controlled either if we have the underground tank or not. Our original design controlled the rate. So then we came back with now controlling the volume by holding a, f a half a foot of water in the bottom of these, well, I'm not an engineer, so I could be misspeak, misspeak, misspeaking, but we're holding it down there and then we're going to Looks like now we're going to put it into some kind of uh, automated system that'll use it to uh, sprinkle the uh, garden beds. You know, all that. You know, all the grass. You know, I wish I had that in my office. It could turn on and have my flowers uh, watered every night. So that's how we're doing it. I think Krista, your township engineer, uh, looked over everything, and everybody's on board with what we're doing. Again, above and beyond what's actually required by code. I, mean, I think we're the first people in the township maybe around here who are actually having a system like this with the pump out because we can't infiltrate because of the limestone. Krista, can you give us your insight on sure. this? I mean, I really would like the take home answer of is this actually going to help improve the current situation? You know, is it going to make it worse? Right. So there are three ways to control volume of stormwater. Oh. Um, one of them is infiltration, which we can't do here. Uh, another is evapotranspiration, which is what plants do with water. And then another is capture reuse. There aren't any other ways to address volume than those three. So what they're left with is evapotranspiration and capture reuse. And capture reuse is what they'd be doing. They're, they're it's like a giant rain, um, rain barrel underground, and that seven inches will never be able to get out through the basin discharge. It will be pumped to sprinkle the landscaping, which will result in evapotranspiration of that volume of water. So it will not go onto any neighboring properties. It will be evapotranspirated. So are you also saying then that this would, I mean, like it sounds like right now, from what I hear the Wilson say, there's ongoing problems now with water hitting that area. Would this potentially improve that? I believe it would. And it will improve that condition by um, reducing the rate of discharge and the volume of discharge. Both rate and volume right. would be reduced. And I, I applaud you. I thank you for listening to us at the Planning Commission and for working with the township engineer to come up with this solution, which you rightly point out is not legally required, but uh, uh, we recognize it. We appreciate it. Krista, can I ask a question about sure. what happens uh, when the land, like if all this water is going to the landscaping needs, what happens when the landscaping is oversaturated? you wouldn't want to sprinkle at that time or or water the plants at that time you'd wait until it's dry 
I guess if it were saturated, then it would be more likely to then run off because it couldn't be absorbed into the soil. And would a system like this be able to, you'd be able to pull back and not? I suppose it would be up to the owner to water at the appropriate times. And that could all be memorialized in the, there's a BMP maintenance and operations and maintenance plan that's part of the plan set. So it says, you know, catch basin shall be inspected after each significant rain event. Um, debris must be cleaned from, you know, it, it outlines specific procedures that they will need to follow. And then that will then be controlled by that agreement that was discussed earlier. So these are all things if they're not doing the operations and maintenance of them, we could enforce using that agreement that they'll have to sign and record. Do we have any other stormwater management systems like this in the township that you're aware of? Not that I know of. Yeah, I didn't think so. This is something that's done a lot in the city of Philadelphia where they have um, a DEP agreement that they have to um, do, do a lot more and they address volume, so. That's pretty much where we got the system from. Mm -hmm. it, it works in the city, you know, try it out here. Do we have any other questions from the public or the board related to stormwater management? Because I would like to circle back to the fees. Uh, I think, Vince, that it is an excellent point that you bring up about the significant lower fee for park and rec. Uh, but I also very much appreciate what you're wanting to do. And Charlie started this with talking that this is a unique project with restor restoring a historic property, which I, I very much appreciate uh, that. So I'm in a little bit of a conflict personally here with what to do. And I don't know what kind of number it, we might come to you know, with regard to the traffic fee. You had already withdrawn the park and rec and are willing to pay that. But again, that is significantly already a reduced rate or fee. I guess that is the better word. Um, so I'm stuck right here with what number to come to because I, I, I don't know. And I don't know that we need to answer that right now. Certainly the rest of the board can, you know, feel free to weigh in on this. But well, without digging into the calculation of the trip generation and credit for the existing house and all that. I think the number came out to $17,703 if we propose a partial waiver and pay half of that. I don't know if there's a question for Charlie or, or, or Dave or Rick. I mean, how, how often? I can't. Well, it's, it's negotiable. No, but I, I, I know <laughs> it isn't everything. Um, yeah. How often do we negotiate our oh. traffic impact fees? Well, I, I think that's, you know, it depends on the project. Um, you know, each project is unique. You know, it's something that you don't have to agree to. You could just hear the proposal, think about, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, make a conclusion about it. Um, but it, it really depends on the project. Some projects, you know, it's a, you know, property, you know, it's a new property, it's a new development, you know there's going to be trip generation, there's really no reason to waive it uh, because of the impacts that it's going to have with regards to traffic. Um, other times there's been scenarios, you know, very different, but that the board has said maybe there's a reduction, maybe there's a waiver. So I really can't answer your question because it's really dependent on the project and each project is different. In, you know, in what they're trying to do or the request or the reason behind the request. And I'm sure some, some applicants, you know, try to get it waived and, and make arguments and others just don't even bring it up and, and pay it as well. So Absolutely. it's not, Absolutely. I guess, you know, it'd be a fluid number, it's hard to compare. I mean, we're so, looking at a, at a million one we're gonna spend, so. So look, from my perspective, and you probably figure out where I'm gonna, where I'm going with this based on my prior comments. If we're gonna start horse trading on the 17,000, then the park and rec fee goes to 10% of the value of the property. And that's our starting point on, on the park and rec fee. So I'm not sure it's to your benefit to start horse trading on, on the traffic impact fee 
Well, you got one vote, so <laughs> these other people are struggling with it. Well, that's, and, and that's where I stand. I was going to say, if we're going to start a horse trading, then maybe, you know, maybe we need a motion to table this and, you know, and staff can, can talk to the applicant because that's not, you know, it doesn't feel appropriate to be doing that at the, at the bar at court, so to speak. I don't know if you guys have any responses to that. You know, we, I haven't made that motion, but you know, I, I probably would. If, if I could just maybe address the reason for that. Mm -hmm. um, part of the focus of why this building has not been um, utilized or restored is because it's very, very difficult to economically restore, manage, and turn a property like this into an active living building. Um, and so um, we're adding a very, very minor amount of square footage but we have to add some square foot to go through the whole process. And because of that, we're looking at, at a price tag of about $395 per square foot. And when you look at an office condo in Plymouth Meeting, um, 8,880 square foot building is about 145 square foot. There's a 1,500 square foot property for sale right now. I'm sorry, a 3,000, uh, you know, 1,500 square foot property for $300,000, which is $200 a square foot. And so, um, my concern is that I would love this project to go forward, but I have to make sure that this is within the realms of ranges of uneconomic activity. Um, and and I, again, I, I don't mean to believe this, but part of turning this into an active building means the township gets more revenue uh, in the future from uh, real estate taxes, school taxes, and um, employment income taxes. Uh, and those numbers are going to be significant. Uh, with the firm that we have and, and the business that we have. So um, what I'm trying to do is you know, keep a promise to my wife not to spend uh, more money on a, a project like this than we actually have to the house. Um, but what I'm also trying to do is set the message for future restorations inside the historic district that the township is looking to have a partnership with the public private to help make sure that these buildings can actually get restored. And again, I, I appreciate the, the generosity of reducing that from the maximum amount that could be. My only dilemma is that if those numbers become the maximum amount, then the level of, of economic of um, disadvantagement that these buildings come to the market value just get higher and higher, and buildings fall out of condition and, and they don't get maintained. And when I drive up the historic district, it's 200 acres. You know, this is started in 1971 to preserve property from the threat of uh, 476. And so how do you keep them preserved? Well, you keep them alive. You keep buildings in them. You keep businesses in them. And so um, because of the cost per square foot, that was the reason uh, that I, I came for that request. And I, we're just trying to do what we can to have a property that in October, when we received the financing, it was appraised post-completion for $900,000. And we're already looking at a uh, cost currently right now of approximately 1.1 million. Um, so uh, again, I, I want to make sure I can do the best I can, uh, but I also don't have unlimited resources to make that happen. And, and I, again, I, I appreciate the discount uh, for that Parkinson and Rex fee, but uh, with the cost of historic buildings, um, I just want to invite the township to work with uh, like-minded historic individuals to say, what can we do to keep these properties intact growing to tell the story of the history. I mean, the map in 1871, a guy named Joel Lair was the owner. Um, he was, as a young man, his dad died, and he was apprenticed to a blacksmith. And uh, he took over the business there, and he became a member of the Quaker house. And when he died in 1895, he was the oldest living uh, Quaker clergyman. He's buried in the cemetery in the Friends Meeting House. Um, so I'd love to make this the Joel Lair building and tell the story. But we have to make these buildings economically viable. So. That's the reason I asked that, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. I wasn't sure if you were going to say something else. No. Sorry. <laughs> Do I have a motion to table 27 East Germantown Pike to September 2nd? 9th. 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 So moved. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you.
Okay, we are moving on. Do I have a motion to approve a hold harmless agreement for a fence and shed in the ultimate right of way at 34 Sugar Maple Drive? Okay. So moved. Second. Um, Charlie? Good evening. Okay. Yeah, this is um, a hold harmless agreement for a somewhat unique property that has three frontages um, Joshua Road, Sugar Maple Lane, and Locust Way. And the owner would like to put up a seven foot fence along Joshua Road, which is in the ultimate right of way. He is also proposing to relocate a shed behind the fence that will also be partially in the ultimate right of way. Um, this is the site plan that shows it as best we have. Um, this is Joshua Road at the bottom of the plan, uh, Sugar Maple Lane, which is how the property is addressed because it fronts there, um, and behind it is Locust. Um, this is the fence that is being proposed at the, the Zoning Hearing Board approved as a seven foot tall fence and extending along Joshua Road at that same height. Um, and this is the shed that's being relocated from here to here and a portion of it's in the alternate right of way. The alternate right of way unfortunately is not on here. It kind of goes straight through here kind of like about there. Um, the condition that the zoning hearing board placed on this was that the um, police would have to approve the fence because of site distance issues. Um, again, the intersection of Sugar Lane and Joshua is here. The police went out the last week of um, July, did a site visit, and determined that this fence will have no impact on the site distance of cars coming out of this intersection looking um, left down Joshua Road. So they have no problem with this. Uh, based on that and based on the um, Zoning Hearing Board's decision, staff is recommending approval of the Hold Harmless Agreement. Thank you. Welcome. Any board questions? Any public comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes. Do I have a motion to authorize escrow release number one for Butler Ridge White Marsh Shopping Center in the amount of $707,050.80? So, so moved. Second. Hello. Um, this is release number one for White Marsh Shopping Center. Um, it's a partial release, and if released, there would be one hundred and sixty thousand two hundred and sixty-eight and forty cents remaining in escrow. We have our office has inspected the request and found the improvements that have been constructed per plan, and recommend release of escrow. Thank you. Any board comments or questions? Public? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Do I have a motion to authorize escrow release number seven for the Knolls at White Marsh, Germantown Pike in the amount of $64,488.29? So moved. Second. Thank you. Krista? This is uh, escrow release request number seven for the Knolls at White Marsh. Um, it's a partial release. And after this release, there would still be $290,637.81 held in escrow. Our office has inspected the site and found the improvements that have been constructed per plan and recommend release. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm just checking if there's any. Yeah, okay. <laughs> any other board comments? Any public comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. <coughs> Do I have a motion to approve expenditures totaling $892,351.95 
and payroll totaling $672,100.60, and pension paid costs totaling $5,650.13 for July 2021. So moved. Second. Second. Any comments? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Great, thank you, motion carries. Do I have a motion to amend the agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. So we have a few additional items on our amended agenda, but I'm gonna skip down. We have one that is not on the uh, publicized agenda, but that will get updated. Do I have a motion to approve the appointment of John Pedicino to the Media Communications Advisory Board, term ending December 31st, 2023? So moved. Second. And I think John is here. John, you do not have to come up. I don't want to put you on the spot, but you are more than welcome to if you'd like to. John Pedicino, I've been a resident for over 20 years now. Um, Ryan Hurley had, we have interaction through local groups and community organizations, uh, talked to me about the media board and I'm looking forward to working with you all on that and Fran as well, so. Thank, thank you. you so yeah. much. And thank, thank you Thanks, for John. coming and Absolutely. hanging in there through this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Any board comments or questions, public? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Great, motion carries, welcome, thank you. Okay, moving on to our amended agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the certificate of appropriateness for the installation of an outdoor fireplace at 2 Catherine Lane? So moved. Second. Charlie. This um, might, seem familiar to you um you've approved a certificate of appropriateness for a uh, covered deck at this address um in may on may 13th uh, just as a reminder to catherine lane is toward the end of the cul-de-sac the, these all all of the um certificates of appropriateness are on catherine lane in the maple hill development uh, and this is the first one and what the applicant is doing here is adding a gas fireplace to the deck. Uh, no change in the deck that was approved. He's just um, adding the gas fireplace in the corner of the deck. Uh, it's a, another better picture of the location. Uh, again, this is the far side. The house is up here. It's connected to the house here. This is the far side of the uh, deck. Uh, this is a concept of what the fireplace will look like. Uh, stone is being used the same as what's on the front of the house now. Um, he came to Harb yesterday, uh, August 11th, requested uh, consideration. Harb had no issues with it and recommended approval of the certificate of appropriateness. Wonderful, thank you. Are there any board comments or questions? Any public? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye 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 motion carries thank you do i have a motion to approve the certificate of appropriateness for the installation of a roofed deck and fireplace at eight catherine lane so moved second charlie moving down three houses a little closer to spring mill road um another uh catherine lane address eight catherine lane here this is um, the installation of a roof deck with a fireplace um, not very different than what you've seen just a minute ago. Here is the um, location of the deck in the rear of the home. Uh, again, a blow up of what the deck will look like. Again, the house is here. The deck is to the rear. An idea of what the roof will look like and a concept of what the fireplace will look like and again uh, the materials being used are materials that are similar to what's already on the house in terms of both the roof and the stone and harb again reviewed this yesterday and saw no issues with it and recommended a certificate of appropriateness 
Thank you. Any board comments or questions? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve the certificate of appropriateness for changing the deck material at 10 Catherine Lane? So moved. Second. And now we're next door to the one we just looked at. Uh, we're now at 10 Catherine Lane. This is one in which you approved a, a deck with a roof uh, back in February. Uh, the roof of the deck at that time was proposed as a standing metal seam roof. The applicant is changing that to an asphalt shingle roof to match the house. Um, because the change of material, he went back in front of Harb yesterday. Harb had no problem with the change of material and again recommended the certificate of appropriateness be approved. Excellent, thank you. Any board um, comments? No, again, oh, this, is a, this is the plan that you've seen in the past and this is again a, this is the plan that was approved back in February. Uh, there's also a patio that's not part of this approval that was approved before as part of the overall scheme. And this is hard to see, but this is the, um, the shingle color that is being used again, matching what's on the house. So are they getting a group discount? Is that what's going on here? <laughs> I think we're almost done with Catherine Lane. <laughs> we should tell them after they give them a time limit. No more certificates of appropriateness after like December 31st. Okay. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a joke. Any other board comments? <laughs> <laughs> Any relevant board comments? Yeah. That's what you want to ask. <laughs> All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Do I have a motion to authorize the order and settlement stipulation between East for East Germantown LLC versus Monco Board of Assessment Appeals resulting in the decrease in the assessment for the 2021 requiring a repayment of $248.17 in township real estate taxes? So moved. Second. Mr. Miller? Yes, this is another assessment appeal that's been agreed upon by the Montgomery County Board of Assessments and the property owner. In this case, the township would have a, a nominal repayment just under $250 for 2021. Thank you. Any board comments, questions, public? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. We are now to the public comment period of our meeting. Do we have any public comments? Nope. Any board comments? I'd like to announce that we did have executive session earlier tonight where we discussed litigation. And do I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Good night, White Marsh.